Good afternoon, everybody. The water is needed because I think there was quite a lot of talking in the uh, bar last night. Um, I'm going to crib a little bit from a uh, historic, uh, historic England session I was in earlier. Um, HS2 is a non-departmental government body. We are in Perda. Nothing I say is binding. Um, so if it looks like I'm setting policy, I'm not. It's a mistake. Any of my stakeholders are in the room. I'm seeing on the 6th of May. Please don't quote anything back at me too much detail. Um, I work in High Speed 2 Limited's technical directorate. Uh, I'm the topic lead for archaeology and heritage, which means that in the technical directorate, we set the standards and assure uh, the project. So we're kind of like an internal client. Um, so that's the same for, we have lead ecologists, lead engineers, lead bridge specialists, rolling stock specialists. Uh, I obviously sit within the environment section of High Speed 2 in the technical directorate. So this is a new lecture, so forgive me if I uh, have to crib some notes. We're gonna cover five main topics a little bit about what High Speed 2 is, maybe not all of you are quite as familiar with it as I am. What that means for the work that I do, which encompasses the historic environment. How we're engaging with the supply chain. What we're doing about skills and employment, and that's at a fairly high level, not specifically archaeological. And challenges and opportunities. I will be using the word challenging quite a lot throughout the talk. I'm also specifically going to be concentrating on phase one of the project, which is the 143 miles broadly between Lichfield and London, going into Birmingham. Um, phase two is two or three years behind phase one. That's the route that takes us from the connection with Lichfield up to Manchester and Leeds. So that's a few step changes behind. Phase one is occupying our mind at the moment because it has quite a few, from even just a construction point of view, challenges. Now, we're all, I assume, archaeologists in the room or have some knowledge of that industry. You can translate that into the fact that it's um, over £21 billion worth of construction project budget. It's about 67 square kilometres of land take by the time you've got the road diversions, the utility diversions, uh, construction compounds, and everything else that goes with it. So for those of you specifically involved in contracting archaeology, that translates into a great deal of ground disturbance. From an historic environment point of view, we have, for phase one, delivered an environmental statement. That was deposited along with a hybrid bill to Parliament in November 2013. That environmental statement was divided into 26 community forum areas to make it more locally specific and, frankly, more manageable. It was something like 50,000 pages. Um, it was about four metres high when stacked. The statistics of how big that document was. Um, so there wasn't just a cultural heritage appendix at the back or a little chapter. You had to read 26 different sections and then lots of appendices. <laughs> Quite a complicated document. Uh, that was delivered by a series of professional services contracts, so a lot, all of the consulting organisations that employ archaeologists have probably been involved in the project. That work was all done to standards that were set within uh, High Speed 2. It involved lots of design reviews. Obviously, it's all multidisciplinary, so we work with ecologists, engineers, point out that maybe you don't want to put that there on a scheduled monument, maybe you'd like to move it. Um, obviously, we set the baseline for the project, and we've continued uh, consultation and engagement with English Heritage, as it was then, <laughs> local authorities uh, and various communities. There's been a great program of community engagement. I haven't got too many archaeological slides um, to show you because we are really only at the stage where we've done geophysical survey. Uh, the whole route has been lidar however, so that is uh, a decoy pond, duck decoy pond at the top, through the mysteries of lidar, which is actually within happily decoy pond wood. <laughs> um, however, you said that we didn't have access to decoy pond wood and it is a mature woodland, so there was no, you probably wouldn't be able to find it if you'd walked. Um, and then a geophysical plot next to an abandoned church and graveyard, but now we know we've also got an Iron Age and Romano British landscape. So we're busy working through 
the uh, normal process of environmental impact assessment. That was then, this is now. We are currently in select committee for phase one. So we had something like 90, over 1900 petitions against the project, people making their point of view. They are currently being heard, but well, not like now, um, by the select committee comprising a range of uh, MPs. So we're providing a lot of the evidence uh, to our stakeholder engagement teams and our parliamentary teams to tell them how they should respond to this particular concern of an individual or an organisation. We have an active engagement programme with uh, Historic England and the local authority. So very early on in the process, we established a heritage subgroup so that we could keep them informed about how the project was progressing. We're doing a lot of programming with our construction engineers about what, why, when, how. And occupying a great deal of my time at the moment is devising a whole series of route-wide procedures and mechanisms. Because when we do start rolling out full scale for the archaeology, we'd quite like all the archaeological contracting organisations to do it in the same way, so that we can make sense of the data. And obviously we haven't, as an industry, got lots of handy specifications, maybe like the highways guys normally have, that we can just pull off the shelf and say, thou shalt do it that way. So we're having to pull together a lot of the existing standards and expertise to set wide procedures. We're ongoing with our survey work for further geophysics. And obviously the stage of the project that's out is we can only do that with landowner access. So that hasn't always been forthcoming. So at the moment we're continuing that where people allow us on. And perhaps most importantly, supply chain engagement uh, on a company-wide level. Where, and this is, this is really from an engineering point of view, some of you in the room may have been to some of our supply chain events which have been happening up and down the country over the last year or two. HS2 is naturally at the top of the pyramid, quite like this diagram. Um, the second tier down in pale blue is the main construction contracts, which will be direct with high speed two, and that will be quite a small number. The main uh, area of supply chain where the archaeological work will be procured is tier two, subcontracted to the main, uh, the main contract. So I'm going to talk about the Enabling Works contracts uh, in the next couple of slides. But I just wanted to highlight the context of what um, High Speed 2 Limited is doing and how they're engaging. So if you haven't already checked out the various websites and typed in HS2 Business and, and you're interested in opportunities that the project presents, then I suggest you do that. And there are slides and email addresses at the end of the presentation. So SMEs, which I now understand is small, medium enterprises, of which we <coughs> comprise, um, the opportunities for the archaeological and heritage industry, this is where it comes. So those of you who are perhaps familiar with Crossrail and High Speed One, where the client body engage the archaeological organisations directly, that's unlikely to be happening on High Speed Two. We're going to engage the main construction contracts and the enabling works contracts and we'll require them to engage archaeological specialists. So the various supply chain engagements, we've had industry days, and this is not for archaeology, this is for everybody. We've done Meet the Contract Day regional roadshows. I haven't particularly been involved in this aspect at the moment, because obviously the focus of um, my colleagues is mainly to make sure there's enough construction people as well and engineers out there. But as we begin to progress the project, then the environmental disciplines are beginning to come to the fore because we're obviously early activities in the process. Uh, Contract Finder and Compete For are phrases and websites that you need to also be aware of and join. This is slightly scary for the program diagram. It's another challenging program. We are expecting to get Royal Ascent, beautifully illustrated here in purple at the top, in late 2016. That's the projected time scale. Obviously, we're at the um, mercy, if you like, of the parliamentary process. Could take a bit longer. This is what we're programming for end of 2016. And archaeology and heritage works and exhumation works are being focused on 
the Enabling Works contract, I've got a big list in a minute, which is already out to pre-qualification questionnaire, for those of you who don't, aren't aware of that. Um, and that will focus on managing organisations who want to manage the Enabling Works, I'll explain in a moment. But you can see that the yellow bar there is quite a, a challenging time scale. It's the deliberately adopted line out there because there's, it's, we don't quite know what the whole program is going to be or what the overlap of enabling works and main construction works is going to be. We'll have lots of parallel activities, as you <coughs> might imagine, in 143 miles. Uh, and obviously, we'll all be on the train by 2016. <laughs> This is what the enabling works comprises and for high speed 2 it's um, a mechanism where we can de-risk the project so we get as many of the works done early before they start building things like bridges and railway cuttings so we move, high, uh, move roads, establish com uh, compounds, establish storage facilities, uh, ecological mitigation areas, some of which have a very long lead in time and of course archaeological works, exhumation works. I haven't particularly in, um, highlighted historic building works. It's a relatively small element, but take it as read that that's in there. And for us, by doing it this way, with having an en enabling works management structure to design and deliver this, it allows it to be coordinated, because there's a lot of activities on that list. And if we had an archaeological contract direct to, to me effectively, it would be very difficult for me and my team to actually coordinate that. So if you have an organisation whose sole responsibility is to do that, and I should at this point say there'll be the route is divided into remarkably southern, central and northern, so there'll be three large contracts along the way, all delivering the enabling works in this manner. Um, to help facilitate engagement between the construction industry and the heritage industry and the construction industry and lots of other um, sectors, we're working very closely with the Civil Engineering Contractors Association, with SICA, and they are supporting the engagement between the main contractors. It's a bit like speed dating, really, um, because it's not me, though I'm happy to talk to you, it's not me that can help you get the work, it's the construction contractors. So SICA is the um, organisation that will help facilitate engagement. And I believe there's going to be an interview with the uh, CEO of SICA in the next archaeologist, I believe. So again, that's something to, to look out for and read. Um, so that's what their role is at the moment. But we're also, from a company point of view, looking at skills and employment. Uh, we have a skills and employment section, and they are weaving into the contracts some quite strict and demanding requirements for the construction contractors, but also that will be flowing down all the way to their suppliers about how they train their staff, how they, have, how they monitor their programs, how they deliver the right workforce for the right task at the right time. And, and they will be assessed at PQQ on their ability to deliver training and development. And it's, it's almost a pass and fail. So if they don't put in decent programs, then that will count substantively against them. And I think that's really encouraging, because it won't just be the Costains and the Amex of this world who will be writing fancy corporate training and initiatives. They'll be expecting their suppliers to do that and to demonstrate it. And, if the, uh, and from an HS2 point of view, we will be looking to see that that is going all the way through the supply chain and back up and isn't just empty words. So, and it will be monitored. So I find that personally very encouraging. But obviously from an environmental point of view, it's not only the archaeology industry that we might be short of. Uh, we might be short of some ecologists, we might be short of agricultural specialists, possibly some landscape architects, because of the scale of the demand. and the other national infrastructure and other construction projects that you're all working on, house building is on the rise. 
So, you know, we're going to be competing for resources. Um, so the company as a whole undertook us, um, a body of work that MACE delivered for us, looking at what the environmental skills demand were, seeing, trying to understand a little bit about, more about supply, where the gaps were, and the report is only just is only just landing, it's in sort of final draft stage, what their recommendations might be. Now obviously I've taken quite a keen interest in this document um, because fundamentally my role is to deliver the archaeology for high speed too. And it keeps me awake at night when everybody in the room here tells me that we don't have enough people. So it's ended up being quite a qualitative, qualitative report because we're a little bit lacking in really hard data. Everybody tells me we're lacking in archaeologists and people with the session. But there's, and there's various documents that have been produced. But um, it's, it's still quite a difficult thing to measure. And they've looked at defining what skills gaps and what skills shortages we've got, where we've got some people but not enough, or where we actually lack fundamentally people who are trained in a particular skill. So it's been quite useful for them to try and talk to CIFA and FAME and various other organisations in the heritage industry to try and understand people's perceptions. And to some extent, this is very difficult to quantify. A lot of it is about perception. And I've captured these three from their report. And this is applicable particularly to us as an industry, but it applies to ecology, it applies to landscape. Um, we know there's going to be a high demand. Are we as an industry prepared? These are the words of the consultant, by the way, I haven't written this in. Um, maybe we're not as prepared as we might like to be. Maybe you're expecting a lot of answers out of me later. Um, in one of, one of the other disciplines, there's a genuine generation gap where people, I think it was the agriculture industry, are leaving that might be applicable to us as well, with key people leaving and maybe their skills not being replaced. And also the last one at the bottom, our industry favourite, is it's <coughs> development-led. So, you know, lots of people dropped off the cliff in 2008 and we're incredibly vulnerable and we're now just gearing up for hopefully a rising economy. So, the cha challenge is not just to us but to everybody else. Here's another archaeological picture. Um, sorry, it's not. If I come back in two or three years, we might have some archaeological pictures. And again, these are industry issues. I just thought I would highlight what we know sector decline in 2008, the age old problem of paying conditions and fieldwork careers, longevity of careers. Um, speaking to academics recently in some other work, uh, another work stream I'm involved with. They say that courses are in decline because people can't guarantee a job, so they're not doing the, um, the courses, which obviously troubles me because we expect graduates to come through the sausage machine, come out, work for you all, come and work on projects like High Speed 2. I'm particularly being told that these are a special <coughs> skills gaps. If anybody has any difference of opinion I'd be um, happy to or maybe just add to the list that might be the easiest thing um, we're trying to at the moment quantify exactly where we are on high speed too obviously we know we've got key sites that are identified in the environmental statement but at the moment we are working with our construction engineers to work out where they want to be where we know we have an issue where we know we haven't been on the site yet so we don't actually know the scale of the issue so we're trying to quantify it so that we can understand broadly in a program term how many sites, what, when, have we suddenly got a cluster of Roman sites being programmed and that might lead to a, an issue of, of, of shortage of Roman specialists. Some of the possibilities that they've highlighted and that we've been discussing um, really very briefly at the moment with Historic England, CIFO and FAME or perhaps what we could do, for, well, what High Speed 2 could do, what we could contribute to, what's already happening that maybe we need to know a little bit more about. And the two sessions already today have made me aware that I perhaps need to know a little bit more. 
there's a lot of existing initiatives out there. How can we contribute to them? What information might they need from High Speed 2 to make those function better? CPD training for site supervisors, project officers, was a useful discussion we had with CIFA and FAME because they might be brilliant archaeologists, but there's a lot of other managerial skills that are needed, and perhaps um, High Speed 2 could help there. I haven't even mentioned the National College for Rail that's been established because the rail industry and construction industry realised that we weren't going to have enough engineers and uh, the correct skills to build the railway. So they've established or are, are establishing a whole college. The curriculum at the moment is being devised. We're pushing to have an environmental element in there and perhaps there's some wider short courses, CPD training that will be on offer in general that will be useful to the profession. So we're beginning those discussions with uh, my colleagues in HS2. Obviously, those three organisations all have initiatives that I need to understand more clearly. Um, each of your organisations might already have initiatives, training, graduate training programmes, upskilling, staff. It would be useful to know what they are uh, more completely. There's lots of partnership opportunities for the educational sector and between us. And again, as a government organisation, looking at the links that we can make to commercial organisations, educational sectors, all of those things tick the high speed to government requirement boxes. So we're looking at all of these opportunities at the moment. That's why it says possibilities. Perfect. Um, I was trying to think how to sum up really what we want. Um, I could ask you to keep an eye out for high speed two supply chain events. There'll be you know, more coming in the future. Try and turn up or at least go online. If you already have contacts with construction organizations or some that have lapsed a little bit, I would suggest you shake them out and say hello. <coughs> I've got some um, email addresses on the next couple of slides. Um, supporting upskilling the industry. I think that's a really important one for High Speed 2 to look at. Um, because we, you know, we have a delivery, we have a program, we have lots of government requirements. We'd like to employ you all <laughs> quickly. So these are the things that you perhaps need to write down. Supply chain community, ssc at hs2.org.uk. And if you just Google HS2 business, or if you go onto the government search, government websites, you should be able to get in and, and find out quite a lot of information. There is a lot of general information about, that, about it, but uh, I know some of you in the room have already registered and so get um, emails and updates and things. And, you know, you kind of need to be on the list. It would be helpful. Here's a picture of a train. <laughs> this is a corporate picture of a train. Um, I don't know if they're going to look like that, but I thought that would be helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.